the person who's in the most pain is the one that needs to change. And actually, it's it's kind of an interesting idea because the other person actually might be in more pain. You need to change first. It's not like the other person won't, but you need to start the changes. A lot of what's going on in that case is there's a lot of unresolved emotion and some uh, limiting beliefs from childhood that haven't been released yet. Welcome to another episode of Rich in Relationship. And today, the topic is be happily married, even if your partner won't do a thing. And what does that mean, really? The chances are your partner will do something, but we all have this mindset that if only they'll make the first move, then I will. And in reality, we're just going to be miserable SOBs if we don't make a move, regardless of what they do on the other side. And so the philosophy here is let's be happily married and, you know, hopefully that, that offsets everything. And to share with us on this topic is Dr. Abby Metcalf, who wrote a book exactly titled this, by the way, and we're going to talk about that more. She is a relationship maven, a psychologist. She is an author, a podcast host, a TEDx speaker, and she has helped thousands of people with their relationships. Welcome to the show, Abby. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy to have you. <laughs> We're already having fun. Jews from yeah. New York. We, we don't know what to do with each other. <laughs> uh, hey, so the question I ask everyone on the front end is, how did your heart lead you to do this work? Well, I, uh, as we mentioned earlier, I um, grew up in, in New York City and I was a heroin addict and I got clean uh, young, younger, uh, around age 20. And, you know, through that process, oh, I was have so much to talk getting about. into different kinds of therapy. And um, I ended up, you know, working in drug rehabs and all the things and doing so this kind of much work to talk about besides this. Episode. There you go. All right. And then, and then I shifted into business because I wanted to help more people, you know, on a larger scale. And I started working with executives who had drug and alcohol problems mm -hmm. and in a uh, large uh, multinational mergers and acquisitions. And what happened was uh, because I also had a counseling background along with the business background, I was sort of counseling. I didn't understand the difference between coaching and counseling. <laughs> and I was working with these all men, really, woman here and there. But I was working with them and really talking to them about their marriages because, you know, we're whole people. We're not who we are at work, different from who we are at home. We're, we're whole people. And of course, these men had ter their marriages were falling apart. Their children, they didn't know their kids. It, it, it was a mess. And I was working with only them and they kept coming back and saying, wow, it's so much better at home. My marriage is so much stronger. I'm getting along with my kids, da, da, da. And I, I didn't even key in for a while, but a few years in, I noticed, I thought, wow, how am I changing the relationships at home when I'm never meeting the wives? Uh -huh. I'm never meeting their partners. And so I started to really quantify that. I started to write down, you know, get really clear, like a little, you know, experimenter, a little, a little uh, scientist. What am I doing that? What am I telling them? What are the things that they're doing over and over that, that work, that are changing their relationships at home? And that's what became the Amazon number one bestselling book. That's what became my book. And that's really what brought me to uh, then want to work just with individuals and couples again. And I started the podcast about five years ago and we're approaching a million downloads. It's all very exciting and great. Yeah, it's really great. And so, you know, and everything just started to kind of grow and move. I did the TEDx, you know, blah, blah, blah. But mostly I just, I, I want people to be happy. I think that's the, that's the key to world peace. And if everyone had a happy relationship, we would not be full of hate and anger and resentment. So that's my goal. I love it. And, uh, and, and doctor, I concur. So, <laughs> uh, it, it, if we were writing a, a book, like what, which you did, <laughs> what are the, what are the main points that we're going to hit in this podcast so that people understand how to be happily married, even if their partner won't we'll do a thing, a thing. Well, number I one is. <laughs> I always say whoever's in the most pain needs to change first. And that's whoever's listening right now. And then number two, we're going to hit. Uh, so that's, we're gonna well, go yeah, 
We're well, I would just say that in a I'm big saying, way. Let's outline the podcast. This is completely different than I usually do. It usually okay. free flow, willy nilly. But I'm curious today. What are the kind of the points? Yep. We're get? So that's number one. Number two is really understanding what you are doing unconsciously that you can deliberately do consciously. Mm -hmm. That's going to absolutely shift the course of the relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's things you've talked about the unconscious before on here. And so I'm going to go down another yet another route of that. Uh, and then we're going to, we need to talk about being mindful and self-aware and how different those two things are. And the rest is about kindness really at the end of the day and re self-responsibility and boundaries. Th those are the biggies. Courtesy, courtesy, kindness, patience, and love as they yeah, say, yeah, it as really they say in some books. That, but how do you get there? Right. So that's what we're going to, you know, that's, right. let's, so let's, let's get start there. with number one, numero uno. Uh <laughs> So, well, this idea that, you know, yes, so you need to change, you know, just getting that into your head. This isn't about the other person that the focus needs to be on you. And I love that the person who's in the most pain is the one that needs to change. And actually, it's it's kind of an interesting idea because the other person actually might be in more pain, but they may be they compartmentalize it better or they sublimate it more or, yeah. you know, or they're or they're distracting themselves by being workaholics or they're. Million things. It, it doesn't matter. Like it, it kind of doesn't matter. It's about the fact that you're the one seeking help. You're the one who wants to go to couples. You're the one. So you're in the most pain. And and I say you need to change first. It's not like the other person won't, mm -hmm. but you need to start the changes. And this is where really understanding how your what's happening in your brain, this unconscious motivations. And there's two pieces to that. And one that I talk about quite a bit is from the uh, research of Timothy Wilson, who wrote Strangers to Ourselves. He's a very famous researcher. You know him too, I'm sure. And he, he his research shows the that- The guy our, with the, the, the suede jackets, right? Wilson's house uh, of suede? No, there's a different, uh, no. <laughs> different Wilson. I'm his, sorry. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm learning how to be playful on the podcast. Oh, okay. Okay. I can go there. <laughs> His, so anyway, his, Timothy Wilson, not the guy who owns Wilson's House of Suede, which is probably yeah. now up and out of business, but. Yeah. So his research shows that our conscious brains process information at a rate of 50 bits per second. Mm -hmm. But our unconscious brains or our subconscious are the same thing to us psychologists. Process information at a rate of 11 million bits per second. Mm -hmm. So your partner doesn't hear what you say. They hear what you mean. And I will give you the scenario and the story of how this happens. So I have someone comes to my office and, and well, these days it's Zoom, but, and they'll, I'll give them some great tool. Okay. Go use this. Go, go start setting intention every day and they'll go home. Right. So with me consciously, they're very motivated, right? They're sitting there, you know, everyone's had that they've met with you. They've met with someone or they've listened to the podcast and they're very motivated. When people leave the podcast today, you'll be motivated. <laughs> then they, so they're, but as they drive home or as they walk in the other room or whatever, their doubts start to seep in. So consciously they're like, oh, this is a great idea, mm -hmm. but subconsciously, and even a little consciously there, uh, this won't work because our problems are big. You know, some little tool isn't going to change anything. We've had this problem for many years. One little thing isn't going to change it. It's not going to be something wrong with me. I, you don't have something wrong with me. I, I, even maybe. though it might work for other couples, it might work for my partner. There's something wrong with me. I can't process it. Or maybe, maybe, or maybe another one is, you know what? That sounded really good, but there's some, they're, they're just trying to sell their book or they're just trying maybe. to sell Any their program. Doubt. You know, any doubt, right? Any conscious doubt. mind starts looking for, for all the poking holes in it. Poking holes in all the things. So then you go use the tool. Let's say you're setting intention. But again, so you're saying things, you're you're saying the right things to your partner, but they are picking up on the, that 11 million bits is much stronger. They're picking up on the doubt, on the worry, on the hesitation, right? On the resentment. Like, why do I have to do this? And they're not doing anything. And what happens is they then react to that, not what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So then they don't change. They don't do anything because they're thinking, I don't, she's being nice now. He's being nice now. But how long is this going to last? And, Let I, can me, feel, and I can now. feel, I can feel that there's an emotional undercurrent that isn't being expressed directly, that something's mm -hmm. not right. Right. So or, they, or maybe it's not right. Maybe it's, it's an emotional undercurrent that feels familiar and toxic or it feels familiar it, and scary it could. they I, likely I, I, don't even notice it yeah. they likely don't even realize that that's what they're doing 
but they pick up on it. And even on top, they might think, oh, this is great, but they don't really. Deep down, this other thing is going on because that's what they're picking up. That 11- I'm getting the willies just talking about it. So now they don't change anything, right? Because they're waiting. They're like, oh, well, let me wait it out. Now a week goes by. I've been using this great tool Abby or Rich taught me and nothing is changing. No, Tony so Robbins. I come, so Tony I come uh, or whoever. Yeah, do you so know I, all the good things come from Tony? <laughs> come on, Abby. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's what everyone tells me. Oh, oh, oh. I, I have Tori, I have stories about Tony Robbins because I, I did Tony Robbins back in the day when there was 300 people in the room. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. Ah, uh, listen, I have Tony I, Robbins I, programs that were on like, that were on yeah. cassette tapes. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I did them with him. Yeah, I walked yeah, yeah. on calls with him. But let's, I but let's not go there. Him, but that's a whole other thing. Anyway, so I, I was like, what are we doing? So yeah. I am, right? I think now that this tool doesn't work. And I come back to Abby and I go, he didn't change. Uh, she didn't change. I did it for a whole week and nothing happened. And this doesn't work. And that's not what didn't work. The tool is fine. The tool will absolutely work. What happened was because you weren't aligned consciously when you were really thinking all those doubts and you were having all those worries and all that stuff that is what your partner picked up on Mm -hmm. so when because people ask me a lot they'll say well how long do i have to do this and uh to me it's that as soon as you have that out that mindset it's going to fail because that's the whole point you you don't do it because you're waiting for a certain response that's called manipulation Mm -hmm. You do it because you want to be happy and it feels good to treat people well. It feels good to be generous and kind. Mm -hmm. It feels good. And you're not attached to any outcome of that other than you feeling good, Mm -hmm. other than you doing what you need to do in your world because you're a kind person. Mm -hmm. You're a loving person. You're a secure, confident person, whatever that is. And that's the mind shift that has to happen. If I hear people say, Oh, they'll take advantage of me. If I do this, I'm going to get taken advantage of. No, what does that even mean? First of all, this is this person you've, you know, you're in a committed relationship with. If you think there's someone who's going to take advantage of you, that's a problem. Second of all, in my almost 40 years now of doing this, 38 years of doing this, I haven't seen that happen. Maybe with, if you were married to an extreme toxic narcissist, sure, they could try to take advantage. They could try, but even so, what's the advantage that you're just being kind and nice? I'm not saying to have no boundaries. I'm not saying to be codependent. That's not that's not healthy. I am saying to just be in that frame where you're doing what you do, regardless of what the other person does. You are who you are, not based on how they react to you. I have a feeling we've slipped into some of the other steps here. So step step one is... Well, there's not like step. These all kind of go right. together. There's not steps. There, there's, there's, there's keys that you have to work on all these different things, and so definitely understanding that you need to align your that conscious brain into mm-hmm. what I'm doing. This is who I am. This is what I'm doing, and I'm all in. This well, is it. So let's say that um, I was talking to you before the show started. I have, a, you know, I have a client who's got kind of this bubbly, cal- toxic cauldron thing going on, and he's aware of it. You know, like he's not pretending it's not there, uh, and it, it's very scary for his partner. So he knows he's the one who's in the most pain. You in, in in this frame that you're offering us, what's his method of releasing next personal step. cleansing? Yeah, his next step to me is to start working on his mindfulness and his his moment to moment awareness. Mm-hmm. And I want to be really clear that self awareness and mindfulness are people use them interchangeably and they're not. So, for example, I'm very self aware that I'm controlling. But I'm not always mindful when I'm so I can I end up being controlling because I'm not mindful in the moments that I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. You see the difference. So you can know something about yourself that I hear people all the time. I I know myself. It's like, that's nice. But unless you can change it in a moment, it doesn't really it only gets you so far Mm -hmm. to, to know this thing. And mindfulness, the easiest thing you can do to start that I have all my clients do it is set a reminder on your phone for three times a day for one week. Just any time. Doesn't matter. Seven in the morning, 12 to, you know, eight o'clock at night, doesn't matter. And when the reminder goes off, you stop, notice where your mind was. And trust me, it wasn't on whatever you were doing. It, it, it just, it's never is. So uh, Matt Killingsworth has a great TED talk on this and how our minds wander about 50% of the time and all that. But mm-hmm. regardless, right, you are probably, if you're washing the dishes, you were probably thinking about all the things you have to do the rest of the night. 
not, oh, the dishes feel good in my hands and I'm feeling calm and okay right now. And so whatever you're doing, when the, when the reminder goes off, notice and bring your mind back to the present and just do a little check-in with how you're feeling right that moment. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. good, fine, okay, or not feelings. So you need feelings. I feel content. I feel uh, a little anxious. I And it can be, you know, it can be many different things at once that might seem to, you know, not correspond together, but they, it's fine. So to really sit with that and to name your feelings and realize that you're okay where you are right now, whatever you're doing, you're fine. You're fine. It's all good. You don't have to worry about the future. You don't have to stress about the past right now. And what will happen as you do that, even after a day sometimes or a couple of days is that your brain, because it functions on frequency and recency, that's how our brains do everything. So the more frequently we do something, the more our brain is attuned to it. And the more recently we did it, the more our brain is attuned to it. It's why a new habit is so hard and why we will forget to, you know, a new tool that we learned or forget, mm -hmm. oh, I was supposed to say this thing. Oh, Rich told me to do this. I forgot. That's because it's not frequent yet. And it's not recent yet. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when you do this alarm thing, you're, you're, you're taking care of having to remember. So what happens is the brain sees that as, oh, this is something important because we've been doing it a lot. That's why you do it for a whole week. <laughs> this is, and it just happened. It just happened a few hours ago because you're setting the timer, the reminder for three times a day. And what will happen, and it, people are always amazed and I always get the texts or the calls or the emails. What will happen is that you will be self-aware even when the reminder doesn't go off because your brain thinks this is what it's supposed to be doing. This is where my focus is. So now I'm in an argument with my partner or I come in the house and my partner didn't, I could tell that the garbage cans are still where they were and they're, they were supposed to be brought in or brought out. Right. So I'm already resentful walking in and my brain is going to give me a little like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's just a garbage can. Calm down. You know, this does, you know, because then my brain goes, oh, and they always do this and they never do that. Now, here we go again. Things never change, right? All the things, all the catastrophizing and generalizing. Start playing, yeah. And instead, we can be, take a breath. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was just off and running there, wasn't I? It's just garbage cans. It's fine. It is not a symbol that this person doesn't love. That's what happens a lot, right? We assign meaning to the fact that someone does or doesn't do something. We 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 define it as it means they don't love me. It means they don't care. It means they don't think uh, I'm important. We We decide all this stuff and that becomes the problem. But when we're mindful, and when our little brain will remind us to calm down, take a breath, be happy when you walk in the house, it's okay. Maybe take the garbage cans in because you support your partner and it's not a big deal. Do you know what I mean? Whatever it is. So you can now walk in the house in a calmer place. Most of the time, we just don't realize we're having an emotional reaction mm -hmm. and that's what's creating the problem. Mindfulness is the key. There is nothing more important, frankly, than that. Well, I, I feel like what's missing, though, is um, like in my client example, uh, a lot of what's going on in that case is there's a lot of unresolved emotion and some beliefs, uh, limiting beliefs from childhood that haven't been released yet. And so mindfulness uh, and being conscious and clear about the kind of communication you want to have with people is very helpful in managing the day-to-day -day exchanges, but I'm not seeing that the are so a big opportunity for letting go of that old baggage there yet. So I'm curious, how does that piece fit in? You know, I, I think I have a different view on that. I mean, if you look at DBT, which has been, you know, dialectal behavioral therapy, which is one of the only things shown to really, you know, were an EMDR, you know, things that other than rewiring the brain, we're really looking at something where mindfulness is the first step always, this spiritual aspect, this way of bringing ourselves to the present so we can notice the trigger. And I'm I'm not someone who thinks that we have to, I don't think there is closure and I don't think we resolve all the things. I think we continue to have a new habit that makes it better and that replaces the old. That is how I see it. So that's new neural pathways in the brain. So we probably differ on that quite a bit, but you, you got to you got to empty the cup to fill it. I mean, at some I, at some yeah, point, at some point, I think we make a bigger cup. At some point, repressed emotion needs expression. I, at some I, point, we need yeah. to learn the lesson that we didn't learn. 
Yes, I think we have to learn the lesson, but I see it as the cup just gets bigger. So the stuff that we had from our childhood becomes smaller and smaller as we- well, I wouldn't it. disagree with that either. All right, so um, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, in this frame, you know, I just, I, I know there are these, that we all walk around with this stuff and I'm just trying to see how it fits. All well, right, so trauma in, so for in, sure will in create frame, more- In this frame through mindfulness, and through deepening our understanding, we've got more space and the significance of those things diminishes. Yes. Well, and yes, and we're creating new neural pathways to create new habits that take over. It's sort of like, you know, when I when I got clean, you know, uh, they said, oh, you got to get rid of people, places and things. Right. You know, you have to stop hanging around in these places. And when I'm counseling people now who are trying to get clean and sober, I don't tell them that I tell them to add because when you tell when people think of loss and like getting rid of all these people that they knew, oh, my friends, I can't say no to my friends anymore. Or my family, I can't just cut them off. I to me, add people who are healthy and mm -hmm. you will by default have less time and energy and space for these people who are less healthy. Got it. Right. All right. So let's talk about the missing piece of the puzzle here. So there you are, you're, you're becoming more mindful, you're adding new habits, you've got, you're increasing your self-awareness, your cup is getting bigger, the impact of the triggers is diminishing, and you've got this other person. So mm -hmm. what's happening over there as you do that? So as you start, as those things start to align, as you are kind, not because you're waiting for them to be kind, but because that's what you do now all the time that's what people start to pick up on. And guess what? They, and that's what was happening with these executives I was working with, right? They weren't, they weren't doing anything with their wives. They didn't even think, they didn't care about their wives half the time, you know, they, other than being bugged by them, nagged by them. And, but what starts to happen is you're a different person and you're putting out that energy. People start to react in kind. That's that 11 million bits. So now I can feel, wow, this person is really nice, even though maybe they did something I didn't like, or they said something that before would trigger me. But I am starting to come on board with my, again, unconsciously, not really consciously, with what's what they're really feeling and saying. And now I start to act a little, a little different, just a little. I'm shifting just that slightly bit and say, now I'm looking at my partner going, hey, I feel something a little different here. And I'm more motivated to keep the kindness or the changes or whatever I'm doing. And it's like an upward, you know, Barbara Fredrickson describes it as an upward spiral. And so you're starting to have this upward momentum and spiral. And that's what I see over and over and over. It's kind of amazing. It, it It's about, you have to really understand how the brain works, you know, what's really happening there. And we have something else, which I think you've talked about before, you know, your reticular activating system. You've talked about that before, right? Your RAS, which is a, a filter between your conscious and your subconscious brain, right? And what's so important about that, the example I always give in case someone's new to your podcast right now, the example I always give is if you buy a, if you want to buy a new car and you see that car all of a sudden everywhere, right? You see it everywhere. It's because consciously you're thinking of a gray BMW and your unconscious goes, oh, that's important. I'm going to look for gray BMWs. Well, and that's your RAS. In the same way, it will start to filter out other cars that aren't gray BMWs. So it seems like that's all you're seeing. Now, the problem is if I think, well, my, hu my husband always nags me, guess what happens? <laughs> uh, my RAS sees that, look for my husband nagging me, and I will find lots of quote unquote evidence of it. And more importantly, my RAS will filter out anytime he's appreciative, anytime he says thank you, anything that doesn't match. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing all this, not only is that 50 and 11 million bits at work at play, but you're engaging the RAS, again, another part of your brain chemistry to look for good things. You're literally creating that. And that's what you start to see more and more because people do, it's not always or never, you know, that, right. That's not true. So you really start to see the times when they do show up, when they do have the nice thing to say, when they do. And again, that starts to feed on itself. And lastly, you know, we from psychology, we have a confirmation bias where we like to prove ourselves right all the time. So when you're really looking at how the brain works, both biologically and, and, and psycho, psychologically, when you start to shift these things, that's why you see dramatic changes. And so, yeah, you know, at some point, often we have to go back and do childhood trauma work or other kinds of things. But 
we actually now have some re and we know with a lot of that work, we do resource work first. And this is like that resource work first, where you're starting to have some good things. You're starting to be able to feel confident and like you can make something happen and you're starting to shift, which gives you more resources when you do the harder work. So let's go back to the couple. The one person who's in pain has been making all these changes and they're uh, they've, they're showing up at more courteous and kind and patient and loving. Uh, and let's pretend that the other person just doesn't see it. You know, what's, what's your worst case scenario? Um, again, it would have to be a pretty serious mental health issue that they, cause they don't like necessarily see it, they feel it. And that's the shift that happens. Mm -hmm. Um, but the worst case is that you're happy. <laughs> Bam. And the other person's not. Yes. And yeah, you your worst case is, you that, is that you're happy. If they can't handle it, they check out. If they can handle it, eventually they're going to adjust and shift. They Something's going to happen. Uh, yeah. they, they, you know, if you're not showing up the same, they, they can't react the same for very right. long. Right. So that's your worst case scenario. Got it. Yeah, it's kind of nice, right? It, it really does change. And, you know, something I, the things that I do in my personal life are things I've used over the, that I've learned over the years from my clients. That's, that's how I do it. I read the research or do whatever, and I apply it to the clients and I see what works and I see what doesn't. And then, you know, it gets better and better, right. With how much better we get after so many years of doing this. And then I apply things to my own life. Mm -hmm. Well, it's working. Let me try. And I will tell you, I'm super happy in my relationship. Ships, nice. I should say, I, I look at, at my Gary, my hubby, I look at him with, I'm excited, as excited today as I was decades or more ago. Like I, I'm using, I use it myself. My children are happy and I'm happy with them. We don't fight a lot. You know, there's, it's not utopia or some Pollyanna world. It's actually a world you can achieve where you feel, and I hate that word happy, really like content, satisfied, replete most of the time. So I have bad days. I have times where I'm upset. Gary bugs me occasionally. You know, of course, we're normal and human, but it's such a small part of my daily existence mm -hmm. and of my client, you know, of the clients I do, we do this with. It's really, if you're ready to really just feel differently day to day, the only reason, oh, here we go. The only reason you want your, your partner to start acting better is because you think that'll make you happy. The only reason we want any goal is for how we think we'll feel on the other side, right? We want it. We want to have more money because I'll feel more freedom, whatever it is. With our partners, I'll be happier when they blah, 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 mm -hmm. right? And the bottom line is, you, you know, I'm going to say it right now. You can be happier, period. Not when, not if, not just be happier. So you can already have the goal you're looking for. Sweet, sweet. Abby, how can people find you? Uh, the best way is really my website. There's links there to, you know, social media and the podcast and all all, all the other things in the blog and all that. So it's at, it's my name, abbymedcalf.com, um, A-B-B-Y-M-E-D-C-A-L-F.com. I'm sure it'll be in your show notes. Uh, that's the best way to get all the goods. And, uh, you know, for some reason, folks, you can't access it. Reach out to us. We're happy to share Abby's information with you. You know, Great. she she clearly is accomplished and a knowledgeable human being and she's got this best felt best selling book and she, you know tech speaker <laughs> and all this good stuff to boot we want you to find her yeah. abby what is the legacy you want to leave behind world peace i know it sounds it sounds crazy when you say it isn't it but are you again, miss america i i you know hello my little wave um, I was prom queen. Uh, no, uh, I, it is really, I really, I do. I believe this, that I just know it as we're happier. Think of every person you've ever helped, then their children are better off and their children are better off. I mean, that kind of legacy is, is, is a gift. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's so that's what I'm looking for. I'm with you a hundred percent. I think when we are fulfilled and satisfied within ourselves, we're a lot less likely to make trouble with other people. It's so true. Oh, yes. I'm with you 100%. Out to God's ears. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. It was wonderful.